by thee, brother. Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient, yet for love's sake I rather beseech thee, being such as one as Paul the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, thou therefore receive him, that is mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he may have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel." But without thy mind would I do nothing that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. For perhaps he hath departed for a season that thou shouldest receive him forever. And I want you to just notice that. He said he departed for a season. He said, but I want you to receive him forever. Notice the next verse. Now, but, uh, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord? If thou count me, therefore, a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it, albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have joy in thee, in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you, Lord, thankful for your word. Lord, thankful for this church. Thankful for those that have come, Lord, to receive your word and to hear the word. Lord, we pray, God, that you would... Open hearts, Lord. Help me as I preach, God. Give me the words to say, Lord. We thank you for everything that we've experienced, everything that we've enjoyed this morning. Help your word to speak to our heart. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Here in this book of Philemon, we find a beautiful story of forgiveness and restoration. Maybe you don't know the story, and when I read that to you, if you hadn't read it before, sometimes it kind of sounds like Greek to you, but here's the story. The Bible says there was a man named Philemon, and he had a slave whose name was Onesimus. Everybody got that? So if you want a unique name for your child, just name them Onesimus. No, don't do that to your child. They got to go to school. But we find that Philemon had a, a slave, and his name was Onesimus. Onesimus. And what happened was that Onesimus stole from Philemon and then left. He ran away. So you find the story of a slave running from an owner. And in today's society, that sounds very uncommon to us. We're thinking, I can't believe that somebody would own somebody. They would have a, a slave. But in Roman times, it was very common for people to have slaves. Now, don't misunderstand me. It was wrong, but it was very common. It happened a lot. And so here's Onesimus living with Philemon. And for whatever reason, and he gets upset, he gets bothered, he steals from a Philemon, and then he runs into a foreign country, and the Bible says that he goes and he visits Paul in jail. Now you think about that as he's running, he's feeling guilt. He's feeling sorrow. He's feeling like, man, there's something here. I've done, done something wrong. I know this is terrible. I know I'm on the outside. Who can help me? I'll go see Paul. And he shows up and Paul's in jail and he goes in, he visits Paul. And the Bible says that Paul led Onesimus to the Lord. He said, Onesimus, your greatest need is not to be forgiven by Philemon, but your greatest need is to be forgiven by Jesus Christ. And he leads him to the Lord. And we find the story of the book of Philemon is a letter that Paul wrote to Philemon and said, and he said, Onesimus, you carry this letter and you carry it back to Philemon. And when Philemon says, why in the world should I call the police? Why in the world should I forgive you? He said, you give them this letter that I've wrote for you. And we find that that's what Onesimus brings back with him. And we find this place. And I just want you to see a beautiful type this morning. A beautiful type in the scripture. How that Philemon is a type of God the Father. How that God the Father has been, has been uh, uh, had his law broken by me and you. And that what he has said has been offended by me and you. Can I just say it this way? That people have offended God with our sin. We have offended him and we have run away. Does everybody remember when Adam and Eve were in the garden? Everybody remember that? The Bible says that when Adam ate the fruit and he heard the voice of God calling, Adam, where are you? Do you know what Adam did? He did just like Onesimus. He ran and he hid and he got away and he got off by himself and he hid because he was scared because he had offended God. 
And I think about Onesimus, how that he's a picture of you and me. You know what Onesimus was facing if he went back home? He was facing death. You know what the penalty for being a slave and escaping was? You died. But not only you, but every slave that was owned in that house. There's many, many times in the Roman history where one slave would run off, and in one case, the man had 400 slaves, 400. One ran off and escaped, and when they caught him and brought him back, they killed all 400 because of one man's sin. And can I say this, that me and you, Brother Sammy, we're just like that slave that's done nothing wrong. That one man named Adam, he offended God. He brought shame before all of us, and because of Adam, the Bible says that every man must die because of the sin that Adam brought on us. You know, I didn't sin in the garden. Adam sinned in the garden. But because he's kin to me, because he's attached to me, he brings the penalty to me. And if you're sitting here today, you're just like Onesimus and you've never received or experienced the forgiveness of God in your heart. You're just like Onesimus. You're running and you're trying to hide and you're scared and there's shame and you're scared of the wages of sin. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And boy, just like Onesimus was running with nowhere to go, I want to say this to you, that every person that doesn't have Jesus Christ in their life is on this planet wandering and searching for something that's missing in their life. Many people come and they sit in the church, this preacher, I don't really know what's going on in my life, but there's something missing. There's something wrong. You know, preacher, I don't feel good. My mind's not right. Something's wrong in my life. What in the world is it, preacher? What in the world am I missing? I want to say this to you. You're just like Onesimus. You need the forgiveness of God in your life. You need God to step in and to forgive you for how you've wronged him and to change your life for good. And I want to show you a couple things here, and I want you to see these in the Scripture, how that Paul was a type of Jesus Christ. Paul said, you know what I'll do for you, Onesimus? I'll make everything okay between you and Philemon. And you know what Jesus Christ wants to do for you today? He wants everything to be okay between you and God the Father. You see, what you've owed God, he wants to pay it. What you've done wrong before God, he wants to fix it. Can I say this? He wants to mediate between you and God the Father. Jesus wants to say, listen, I'll go talk to him for you. Don't you worry about it. I've got this. But boy, he needs you to want that in your life. And I want to say this today. There's two people in this church. They're saved people who've experienced that, and there's lost people who are like Onesimus still wandering in the world. Here's what I want you to do today. If you're the one that's lost today, I want you to be like Onesimus. I want you to go find the one that can help you this morning. I want you to go to him and say, hey, I need some help in my life. I need a touch of God in my life. I need you to do what I can't do in my life. And then if you're here and you've already experienced that, you know what I want you to do? I want you to celebrate that this morning. I want you to realize what Jesus Christ has done for you this morning. I want you to get excited about what God did in your life, where you would be if God hadn't have found you, what you would be if Jesus hadn't have changed you. Look around your life and thank him for everything that he's done in your life. I want you to notice the first thing real quick. And Boy, I've got so much to preach. I'm so excited. I was preaching this to my wife this week. Brother Sammy, that's how excited I was about it. Did you notice in verse 18? Let me show you what Jesus did for Onesimus. Paul did for Onesimus, and Jesus wants to do for you. Notice what it says in verse 18. Now get this. I want you to get it. Paul told told Philemon, he said, If he hath wronged thee or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. You know what he told Philemon? He said, Listen, Philemon, whatever Onesimus owes you, you put it on my account and I'll pay for it in his life. Don't you charge him for it, you charge me for it. Don't make him pay the price. I'll pay the price. And friend, Jesus Christ wants to pay your penalty of sin. He wants to take you to heaven. He wants to do it all in spite of you and no matter what you are. So many times in our life we look around and think we're somebody. Sometimes the preacher gets up and looks at himself on Sunday morning and thinks, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Oh yeah, let's go partake from the Word of God. Do you know what I am? I'm just a low-down slave just like Onesimus was that Jesus said, I'll tell you what, he can't pay it, he can't fix it, but I'll tell you what, God, I'll do it for him. I'll pay for his sin. I'll take his price. Let me be what he needs to be because he'll never be it before your eyes. And I want to say this to you, that Paul put his account on him. It'd be like you walking into court. Some of you here know what I mean when I say a speeding ticket. I'm pretty good at getting them. You walk in there, and they say, how do you plead? You say, how can I plead? I was doing 80 and a 55. What can I say? 
Guilty as the day is long. I know the guy in the car is trained. I know his the car is certified. I know he's got all the instrumentation to catch me. I mean, he's even got it on videotape when he said, Matt, why are you speeding? I said, I don't know. I mean, I'm just guilty as I can be. He said, well, you know, there's some penalties here. You know, you're going to have to pay a fine. There's a fine attached to this thing. $81.50, okay? You're going to have to pay that. And I said, well, I'm not worried about that. I'm worried about what it's going to do to my insurance. That's what I'm worried about. You know what they tell you? Well, I hate that. I mean, we're broken up over it. Don't speed and you won't get caught. That's what the judge will tell you. But I want to say this to you, that Jesus Christ, was in the, uh, that Onesimus was in the same place. He looked at Philemon. He was guilty before Philemon. He knew that he couldn't pay Philemon what he wanted. But Paul stepped in and said, I'll pay it for you. And friend, if you're here and you're not saved by the grace of God, you're standing before a judge. He's already laid out what the fine is. And unless somebody pays it for you, you'll have to pay it. But boy, I want to say this to you, boy. Jesus Christ steps up and says, I tell you what, don't worry about the 8150. I got that in my pocket. Don't worry about the insurance. I'll take care of that too. Hey, you go free. I'll pay your price for you. Friend, I want to say this to you. That's what Jesus wants to do for you if you've never experienced it in your life. And let me go on the other side of that. If you have experienced that, quit living in your sin. You know what people tell me all the time? Well, preacher, I, you know, you just don't know what I've done. I can't really go forward. I, I mean, I'm this guy. You know, I was an alcoholic. I was a drug addict. You know, preacher, I had a problem with this. And I mean, who can use me? What can I do? Let me tell you something. If God's put it on his account, it's off you. Forget about it and serve God. That's what you ought to do. Listen, don't let anybody judge you about what you used to be or what you used to do. Listen, if God's forgiven it, if he's paid for it, forget about it and serve God in your life. People tell me sometimes, well, preacher, you know, other people won't forgive me. Well, don't worry about them because he's already forgiven you. Listen, you'll not stand before your neighbor and give an account one day. You're not going to stand before the preacher and give an account one day. You're not going to stand before the people of the church and give an account one day. You'll stand before Almighty God, and if he's paid the price, you'll be fine. You'll be okay. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks in your life. People tell me sometimes, well, you know, preacher, you know, so-and-so said that I can't who cares what so-and-so said? I want you to know this, that if you put it on his account, he'll pay it, and you'll never owe it again in your life. Listen, if you're here and you're trying to tote around your sin and you're trying to tote around your blame, you're trying to tote around your guilt, you think somehow you're going to make it work, you won't, I promise you. Preacher, I'm working on this thing. Well, you need to quit working on it because you've done the, you're the guy that messed it up. Let God work on it in your life. Preacher, if I quit drinking, I'll get saved. You'll die and go to hell before you quit drinking sometimes. Preacher, if I can just whip this problem in my life, then I'm going to get right with God. Listen, give your life to Christ, put it on his account, and God will take care of all the rest of it. Don't try to get right and then get saved. Get saved. Woo. Anybody ever familiar with a scripture in Isaiah chapter 53? If you've never read that, you ought to read that. You're a new Christian. Write that down right now. Isaiah 53 and go find that and read that. It's a prophecy of what Jesus Christ was going to do for us. And one of the parts he says, he says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. You know what he did? He took your grief. He took our sorrow. He said, let me have that. You can't carry that. He threw it over on his back. And he walked all the way up to Calvary with it. And he put it on himself and he hung on the cross. He said, God, it's finished. I paid for that guy's problem. Don't even worry about that. Well, I want to tell you this. You don't need to carry that stuff around. You can't carry it anyway. It's about to kill you. The Bible says that Jesus, who knew no sin, was made sin for us. You realize that while Jesus Christ hung on that cross between heaven and earth, that he in that time period, he went from being God, he went from being the Son of God, he went from being the creator of the universe. The Bible says that he turned into sin for us. He held every sin you've ever committed. He took every bad thought you've ever had, everything you've ever done. He placed it on him. He absorbed your sin, and he took care of your sin on that cross. I said, preacher, you don't know how the bad things I've done in my life. It don't matter. He became that sin for you. I said, preacher, I've been bad. Then you made Jesus bad. You know, it's really bad to think that everything we've ever done, he experienced it on that cross. But he did it because he loves you and me. Boy, just like, uh, just like Paul loved Onesimus. And he said, Onesimus, I love you, man. I know you messed up. I'll take care of it for you. 
That's what Jesus did for you when he saved you. He said, I know you've messed everything up. I know you've messed everything up. I know your life's in shambles, but I love you and I want to take care of it. I'll take care of that for you. Don't worry about it. I want you to look at verse 15, and I want you to look here at the second thing, because I could preach how he bore our sins. May you realize that every bad thing you think you can't overcome, he's already overcome on the cross. And he took all your sin. He placed it on him. You know, the Bible says that there for a while, a while that Jesus said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? God forsook him on that cross because he became sin and God can't experience sin and God can't touch sin. God's holy and he's pure and he can't be around it and he separated himself from God. And Jesus said, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because at that moment he was experiencing the sin of mankind in his life. And I want you to look here, notice what it says. Verse 15, he says, For perhaps he therefore departed for a season that thou should receive us him forever, not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. I want to see, I want you to see this, that Paul told up Philemon, he said, listen Philemon, I know that Onesimus, when he left, he was a slave, and I know he's coming back to your house. He said, but don't you accept him back to your house as a slave, but you receive him as a brother in Jesus Christ. You don't bring him back as some servant going to live down in the slave quarters. You bring him up as a brother in Jesus Christ to you. And friend, when you went to Jesus Christ, a slave of sin, and when you come down to the altar, receive Jesus Christ or when you gave Jesus your heart you went in as a slave to sin but I want to say this when you stood up on your feet you were a brother in Jesus Christ you were a child of God you were adopted into the family of God you went from being a slave to the world and wickedness to being a family member of Jesus Christ in his life and I want to say this to you today. If you're that slave to sin, boy, you can become a child of God. You can go from being the rottenest, most owned person in the world to being a child of Almighty God. You can go from being in the gutter to being in glory. Friend, Jesus wants to save you today. And I want you to know this. I want you to get this in your heart that no matter what anybody else thinks about you, he will look at you and think, well, he's just that old guy that got saved. Friend, I want you to know that God looks down on you, and if you're saved by the grace of God, he sees his child. He sees you as his family member. He looks down on you, and he loves you because you're kin to him. He wants you to live with him forever because you're his child. Friend, I want you to know this, that Jesus loves you as a child. Whoo. Well, aren't you glad he's your father today? You know why he said, disciples, you want to pray this prayer like this? Father, which art in heaven. Because only the children can say, Father. And friend, I want to say this to you. And no matter what your life used to be, it can become a child of God today. You can give your heart and life to Jesus and get up and live a victorious life as a child of God. Boy, he Paul told Philemon, he said, listen, this guy's going to come home, and I know he wasn't nothing but a slave that stole from you. He said, but now he's your brother in Jesus Christ. And boy, when I look at these little kids that get saved, you know what I see? A brother, a sister in Jesus Christ. You know, every time I baptize a five-year-old, you know what I think to myself? This little five-year-old who's got saved by the grace of God, who's just simply put his faith in Jesus, who's just simply said, Jesus, forgive me, take away my sin. This little fellow, this little girl, when I look at her, I see a brother or sister in Jesus Christ. We're kin in the family of God. Preacher, how do I get in? We just give your heart to Jesus. Give your life to Jesus. Say, you know what? I want in the family of God. I want in there. Won't you take me? Won't you allow me to be a child of God? Boy, the Bible says that those that believe on God, he gives them the power to become a child of God. You know what adoption is? A lot of people don't understand. Adoption is somebody that don't have any reason to make you their child. And they say, hey, I want you to be my child. You know what Jesus Christ did for us? He doesn't owe it to us. He does it because he wants to. He took us and said, I tell you what, come on down to my house. You be my child. I'll take care of you. I'll love you and I'll raise you like my own. Friend, I want to say this, that when Onesimus got back home, it was a different situation. It wasn't just employer, employee. It wasn't owner and slave, but it was brothers in Christ. It was the family of God. And friend, if you haven't experienced it, you ought to experience the family of God today. It's been said, and it's probably true, that there's nothing more important than family. Family is the most important thing there is. You know, I tell my kids, I always say, listen, kid, nobody loves you like dad loves you. 
They want to, but they don't. They, they, your friends want to love you. They, they can't love you like I do. Why? Because I'm your dad. I love you. I love you in the good, and I love you when you're bad. I love you when you stink, and I love you when you're awesome. I'm your daddy. I love you because it's my job to love you. It's what God put in me. God gave you to me, and I love you because of it. And I want to say this to you, that when God looks at you, and you're his child, it's because he loves you when you're good, and he loves you when you're bad, and he loves you when you're sideways. I just want to say it like this, that there's nothing more important than family, and the family of God is the most important thing in your world, in your life. There's some of you here, you say, I don't know my mom, I don't know my dad, I've never experienced a family life. Let me tell you something, in Jesus Christ, you can experience the most wonderful family it's ever been. Your earthly family will die. Your earthly family will let you down. Your earthly family will leave you. But I want to say this to you. The family of God will never leave you down. It will never let you down. You've got a Father in heaven that loves you. And when nobody likes you and nobody cares about you, He still smiles on you. And He loves you and wants to make you His child. Mm. Man, dry mouth this morning. More to say than I can get said. Would you look at verse 15 though? Would you notice this third thing? Paul said, you know what? Put your sin, his sin, put it on my account. I'll pay it. Paul said, you know what? When he comes back, don't you take him as a slave. You make him a brother. And I want you to notice here this third thing. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou should receive him forever. I want you, I want you to see this, that Paul said, listen, when he comes back, there ain't no probation with him. There's no, we're going to put him on a little waiting list, make sure he turns out okay. You know, when you get hired at a job and they hire you, you say, well, we're going to put you on probation for six months, make sure this thing's going to work out. I want you to know this, that when God saves you by his wonderful grace, there's no probation period. There's no time period. It doesn't run out sometime. He said, listen, Onesimus is your brother forever. Don't you ever forget that. And when somebody tries to tell you in here, hey, are you saved by the grace of God? Have you been washed in the blood? You say, oh, I have. They say, are you keeping yourself saved? You look at them and say, listen, it ain't about me to keep myself saved. I've been received as a son forever in Jesus' eyes. How many people here just say, well, I don't like the way my child looks today. You're not my child. You can say he's not your child, but guess what? He's always your child. Preacher, what if I disown him? It don't matter. He's always your child. Preacher, what if I don't like him? He's not living right. He's not doing right. He's still your child. I think about that boy down there, the prodigal son. Him two brothers. You got the good kid and the bad kid. The black sheep of the family. That's the prodigal son. He said, I'm out of here, Dad. Give me my stuff. I'm gone. His dad gave more than I would have. I just throwed his stuff out in the yard. That's what I did. He gave him his inheritance. He went down to the, to the bars and the honky-tonks and the nightclubs. The Bible says he spent it on women and drinking and partying. Every dime that his dad had worked all his life to raise, he spent every dime and was so broke, he had to get a job feeding pigs. The Bible says he was so hungry that he would have ate the pig slop. Now I want to ask you a question. Was he still that guy's son? How about when he was partying? How about when he was feeding the pigs? How about this? How about when he realized, hey, I'm messed up, I'm going home. How about on the road back? Was he a child of God? Was he the son still? And nothing changed. Listen, friend, no matter where you're at in your life, if you've given your heart to Jesus Christ, nothing can change. You're a child of God. When God brings you in, he brings you in. Watch it forever. There's no time periods on that. People, I hear people say, well, preacher, I'm trying to keep the faith. I say, well, good luck because I can't do it. Why can't you do it? For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. All my righteousness are as filthy rags. You know, the best I can be, Keith, is trash, garbage, filthiness before a holy God. You said, preacher, but you're the preacher. Let me tell you something. Everybody is a sinner. Everybody's holiness, what they think they can be, is filthiness before God. Every bit of it, no matter how good you think you are, in the eyes of God, it's unholiness. But I want to say this to you. He says, I love you anyway. I'm going to make you my son anyway. And even in spite of you, I'm going to keep you forever. That's what he said. I tell people like this. 
You think God's going to save somebody to lose them? That ain't really saving them, is it? What if you're drowning in a pool and I make it halfway with you and you still drown? Can I get out of the pool and say I saved you? I can't do it, can I? They'd say, you didn't save him, he drowned. Yeah, but I got him up the first time. I got him halfway, I'm at, and then he drowned. I want you to notice that God didn't tell Noah, listen, Noah, build an ark, it's going to flood, and put two pegs on the side of it. Well, Lord, what's the two pegs for? Well, that's where you're going to hang on for the next 40 days. And if you slip, you're done. But if you hang on, you're going to make it. Friend, that's not how God works. You didn't make you, and you can't save you. You ought to get that in your hand. And you sure can't keep you. You know why I can't keep me? Because I'm just sorry, low down, and rotten. And that everything I want to do for God, the Bible says, I do the wrong thing. Paul said, in my flesh, that is in my, he said, in my body, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That when I would do good, evil present with me. You inside of me, boy, I tell you, I want to serve God. I want to do the right thing. Sometimes I wake up and think, boy, I'm going I'm to go out here and do something great for God. But I got to tote this flesh around with me. I got to drag it around with me. Boy, I could preach that verse for a long time. Paul said things like, ye are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Paul said something like this. He said, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, wherefore you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Amen. Paul said, who hath also sealed us and give us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. You see, the Holy Spirit lives in me, and if I get lost, that means part of the Holy Spirit's got to get lost. Boy, God, what he puts in me and what he starts, I promise you, he's going to finish it. You know, at my house, I got a list at my house my wife wrote. And it's called the finish list. And I'm, I'm way behind. I've started a lot of stuff, and I don't finish very many of them. I get real close. I, I, I tr do pretty well. I, I get right up to the edge, and it just, I just, you know. And you know, that's how I would be in my spiritual life, too. But can I say this? That's not how God is. What he starts, he always finishes it. Man, I'll tell you, when he put Noah on that ark, he said, Noah, when you land, not if you land, he said, when you land, this is what's going to happen. Let me tell you something. When God saved you, he said, when you get to heaven, not if you get to heaven. Yeah. I want to give you this last thing. I want you to see it. I want you to notice this. I want you to get this. Verse number 19, Brother Rocky Brown led a little girl to the Lord. And as I was studying this last point, it just, uh, it just resonated inside of me. Last Sunday, she came running up to me. She said, Preacher. I got saved last week. And I said, well, praise the Lord, I'm glad. And she had a new Bible in her hand. And I said, well, did you write it down in your Bible? She said, yeah, I wrote it down right here. It's where I got saved. And I said, listen, if anybody ever tries to tell you that you're not saved, just take them over and you show them, hey, right here on this day at this time, I asked Jesus into my heart. And I want you to notice in verse 19 what Paul says. He said, I, Paul, have written it with my own hand. I will repay it. And I want you to know this, that when you got saved by the grace of God, that God gave you hope in the form of a letter. You know, when he told Onesimus, you go back to Philemon, you tell Philemon everything's going to be okay. You tell him that I, to let you in and to treat you as a brother and to let you live with him forever. And you know what he said, Onesimus, stand there shaking. But what if he says no? What if he says it can't happen? He said, here, you take this letter with you and you tell him that this letter is why I wrote it with my own hand. And if I said it, I'll do it. And you know, I always think about if I get to heaven, not if I get to heaven, when I get to heaven. And I walk up there to the gates and there's some kind of system you got to get in. What if I get up there and on the throne sits God and God says, well, why should I let you in this place? I could say, well, you know, I've been a pretty good guy. But that'd be a lie, wouldn't it? Yeah. Hey, man, I did everything I knew. to. That'd be a lie, wouldn't it? But, but I went to the, I got nothing. Let me tell you something, just like Onesimus, I'm going to say, you know what, God? I got a letter right here that you wrote. And this letter that you wrote for me, it said over here in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9, that if I confess with my mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, that I might be saved. And listen, I did that. And here, listen, this is the proof of my salvation. Here's what I'm trusting in. Here's what I'm hoping in. It's called the Word of God. Listen, this letter, friend, was written so you could look there and you could understand and you could know that you're going to heaven one day. 
And just like that little girl that got saved, I said, listen, don't you ever let anybody tell you you're not saved. Because if the book says that you believe it, it's done for eternity. Amen. Oh, the devil will come along and tell you, oh, you're not saved. I said, preacher, that happened to you? You're a preacher. What happens? I just get over here to this little New Testament. I say, see right there, it says, whosoever shall call. Upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I called on the name of the Lord. I got to be saved. It says it right here. Friend, I want to say this to you. You've been written a letter that when you read it, it ought to resonate in your heart and mind. I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm a child of the King. I'll be there forever and nothing can remove me because God wrote it down. He promised it. And God cannot lie. There's some of you here you can't claim this promise I got highlighted right here because you've never done it. You ought to do that today. You come down here, you get saved on this altar. Somebody takes you in a room, takes a Bible, shows you how to get saved. You could leave this place. You could write down in the front of the cover, saved, October the 27th, 2013, believed Romans 10, 9, never to doubt it again. And boy, when somebody comes to you or somebody talks to you, oh, how are you sure? You just pull out that letter just like Onesimus. I imagine Onesimus trembled when he walked in that front door. But as Philemon read that letter, Philemon understood that Paul loved him. And friends, as you read this letter, you ought to understand that Jesus loves you. He wants to save you by his wonderful grace this morning. Listen, you can go from being a slave to a son this morning. And if you've went from being there, well, you ought to just tell Jesus, thank you for doing this in my life. Yes. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we come to you this morning, Lord, thankful, Lord, for that letter that you wrote for us, telling us that you love us, telling us that you want us to live with you. Lord, we're thankful, God, that you gave, made a way for us to come to you for salvation. Lord, we're thankful, Lord, that old slaves like us can find mercy and grace in you. God, I pray, Lord, this morning, God, there's somebody here, Lord, that's never experienced that change from a slave to a son, Lord, that today would be the day. Lord, bless this invitation. Bless everything that's said. Heads are bowed.